Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. How are you all doing? And I welcome you all uh, to the Dawri Quran class 2024. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And I pray all is well at your end. And today, inshallah, I'll be taking your session. And my name is Zilay Huma. Ramadan Mubarak to you all. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Are you all excited and happy? Alhamdulillah for this blessing. Subhanallah, barakallahu feekum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this Ramadan a life-changing Ramadan. May this be one of the best Ramadan in our lives. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to fast, to pray, to worship in the best. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. All praise and thanks to Allah. Alhamdulillah, he has given us this ability, the strength and the sound health so we can witness the blessing, isn't it? SubhanAllah. Say Alhamdulillah from your bottom of your heart. And Alhamdulillah for the blessing of the Quran, we gather here every day. Listen to a Jews, Alhamdulillah. I just want to ask everyone, how are you finding these sessions? How do you find these sessions? Just one word. You can describe it in the chat box. Just one word. Anything. How do you find this session? Very beneficial. Excellent, Sister Mariam. Yes, I was looking for that. Alhamdulillah. 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 Let's begin, inshallah, with the du'as of knowledge. And hope you're all ready with your books, notebooks, inshallah. Nahmaduhu wa nasalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'd, fa'unzu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Rabbi zidni ilma, Allahumma faqihna fi al-deen, Allahumma ja'al amali kullahu saliha, waja'alhu li wajihika khalisa, wa la taj'al li ahadin fihi shay'a. O Allah, make all of my deeds righteous and make them sincerely to attain your countenance and do not make anything of it for anyone, therefore in intention. Amin, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So, inshallah, let's begin. Inshallah, and let me share. The slides. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem, rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri, wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli, Allahumma ahdi qalbi wa saddid lisani, waslul sakhimata qalbi, ameen ya rabbil alameen. Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen said that of the greatest means of the correctness of the heart, and its soundness is the excessive recitation of the Qur'an. Because the recitation of the Qur'an softens the heart and also increases the heart in firmness. Specifically, when a person recites it with contemplation and recites it while being aware of the fact that it is the speech of Allah. And he recites it while he believes in the truth of its news. And he recites it while he adheres to its commands and leaves its prohibitions. Then it can be expected that he will acquire a lot of good through this Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us that as we go through juz after juz, we increase in our understanding, in our ability to contemplate, in our ability to recognize the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to also act upon them so that our hearts may be sound and also we may have istiqama. We may have correctness and stability in our religion. Ameen. Juz number 11. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says يعتذرون إليكم إذا رجعتم إليهم قل لا تعتذروا لن نؤمن لكم قد نبأنا الله من أخباركم وسير الله عملكم ورسوله ثم تردون إلى عالم الغيب والشهادة فينبئكم بما كنتم تعملون They will make excuses to you when you have returned to them. Say, make no excuse. Never will we believe you. Allah has already informed us of your news. And Allah will observe your deeds. And so will His Messenger. Then you will be taken back to the knower of the unseen and the witnessed. And He will inform you of what you used to do. These verses were revealed on the return from the expedition of Tabuk. Remember that the expedition of Tabuk was truly a test of faith. Not only was the journey long, but the enemy was also far more dangerous than what the Muslims had encountered thus far. It was at a time when people were finally taking their life easy after the conquest of Makkah. And it was also harvest time. This is the occasion where Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu brought all of his property to support the expedition. And Umar radiallahu anhu brought half of it. Many companions worked hard to earn money and to contribute or support themselves on this journey. And those who couldn't afford, they asked the Prophet ﷺ to provide them mounts. And initially, when they were refused, they returned with tears, as we learned in the concluding verses of Juz 10. So where the sincerity and eagerness of the believers was very visible, the hypocrites also exposed their true colors. Some of them made excuses and some didn't. We see that an army of 10,000 Muslims left for Tabuk, marching 600 kilometers, in which 18 people would share one camel. And remember that in Tabuk, there was actually no battle because when the Ghatafan tribes who were the allies of the Romans learned that the Muslims had come all the way to fight, they resorted to just making peace. So there wasn't any battle. So the Prophet ﷺ then returned. And the round trip was 50 days. So on the return journey, these verses were revealed. That when you will go back, then the people who did not come along with you, some of them will come to offer excuses, false excuses in apology, simply to appease you. But the thing is that words alone are never enough to please someone. This is why it is said, say, make no excuse. Never will we believe you. Meaning we will never believe your lies. We will never affirm them. Why? Because Allah has already informed us of your news. And Allah's word is true. So we won't believe you. And there is no need to present these lies. And now Allah will observe your deeds. And so will his messenger. Meaning in this life, the actions of a person prove their honesty or their dishonesty. Then you will be taken back to the knower of the unseen and the witnessed, meaning you will return to Allah after you depart from this world. And from Allah, nothing at all is hidden. And He will inform you of what you used to do, meaning the reality of your deeds, the worth of your deeds, whether they were sincere or not, and what reward or punishment they deserve, all of that will be informed to you. So the fact is that a person's actions, their reality is exposed sooner or later. وَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ The messenger will see in this life. Meaning your actions will become clear to people. And this is why we see that even if a person tries to cover up their lies with excuses, you know, they try to cover up their faults with lies, with excuses, with pretense, their reality becomes exposed. And this is why instead of focusing on our external image before people, we need to make amends on the inside. That who are we really? Why are we striving? And who is it that we are trying to please? How are we in private and how are we in public? We look at ourselves in the mirror and make sure that our physical appearance is good before people. 
But we also need to look inward. We need to introspect so that we can correct ourselves. Because remember, Allah does not look towards your faces, your physical appearances, nor does He look towards your deeds. But He looks at your hearts and your actions. So a person's good image, their reputation, their good name will not aid them before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because on the day of judgment, the truth is going to be exposed. We learn in a long hadith that how on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call a person and he will say, oh so and so, did I not honor you and make you the chief and provide you a spouse and subdue for you horses, camels and gave you an opportunity to rule over your subjects? And the person will say yes. And then the person will be asked, did you not think that you would meet me? And he will say no. So Allah will say, well, we forget you as you forgot us. And then the same question will be asked by another person. And he will say that, oh my Lord, I affirmed my faith in you and in your book and in your messenger. And I observed prayer and fasts and I gave charity. And he will speak in good terms like this as he would be able to. And Allah will say, well, we will bring your witnesses against you. And the man will think in his mind that who will bear witness against me? And then his mouth will be sealed and it will be set to his thighs, to his flesh and to his bones to speak. And so his thighs, his flesh, his bones will bear witness against him. Why? Because then he will not be able to make any excuses for himself verbally. And in the hadith it is mentioned that this is the person who will be a hypocrite and Allah will be annoyed with him. Because very often we use our words to cover our deficiencies. But before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will not be able to do that. They will swear by Allah to you when you return to them that you would leave them alone. Meaning they make excuses so that you don't get upset with them. You don't reprimand them. So you know what? Leave them alone. Don't reprimand them. Why? Because in Nahum Rijs, indeed they're evil. They're impure inwardly. So don't waste your time with them. And their refuge is hell as recompense for what they had been earning. We see that at times, someone's lies are very obvious. And you catch them red-handed, but they still come up with a sob story of their innocence, crying crocodile tears. So how are you supposed to respond? Sometimes it is your own children who lie to you. Sometimes there's infidelity in marriage and that is covered up with lies and tears. And such lies hurt the most. So one way is that you accuse them, you humiliate them, you prove them wrong and you insult them and you threaten them. But what is the outcome? The outcome is anger and fighting and abuse and the complete destruction of the relationship. But if you turn away from them, where you neither accept their lies, nor do you deny what they're saying because they're using the name of Allah to defend themselves, then ignoring them, turning away from them is better. Neither say, okay, I believe you, or I forgive you, nor be harsh with them, but simply turn away from them. Be silent over there. Because you know what? Argumentation and discussion helps when the other party is willing to acknowledge their mistake. But when the other party is not even willing to acknowledge their mistake, they're just lying with bigger lies, one after the other, then why should you waste your time with such people? So the Prophet ﷺ and the believers are told that when these people come and lie to you, then just turn away from them. يَحْلِفُونَ لَكُمْ لِتَرْضَوْ عَنْهُمْ They swear to you so that you might be satisfied with them. Meaning, they just want you to be happy with them. And this is also from hypocrisy, that a person is obsessed with pleasing people. A person is obsessed with looking good in the eyes of people. They have no fear, no shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they have a lot of fear and a lot of shame before people. So it is said, but if you should be satisfied with them, indeed Allah is not satisfied with the defiantly disobedient people. So the fact is that even if we manage to please people with lies and two-facedness, even if people don't find out about our betrayal, the fact is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And Allah does not approve of such lies. So how could a person ever be successful? 
Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, some people among the hypocrites used to remain behind when he went out for a battle. And then they would be pleased to stay at home behind the Messenger of Allah. And when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam returned, they would put forward false excuses and they would take oaths wishing to be praised for what they had not done. So you see there are people, they will lie to you at your face. And there are people who will backstab you, who are very good at putting multiple masks on. They will be so good in front of you. They will come to you as your best friend, as your advisor. But behind you, they're out to harm you. Sometimes inciting your own friends and family, your own spouse and children against you. They don't come at you openly as enemies because of the benefits that they receive from you. but they try to harm you from behind your back we see that yusuf alayhi salam it was not the wolves who killed him it was his own brothers who tried to kill him who got rid of him so we see that at times there are people who will pretend to be very nice to you but in reality they are your real enemies there are people who will pretend piety before others they will display fake you know religiosity superficial displays of religiosity that oh i'm so bad and other expressions and such pretense remember is not pleasing to allah lies do not please people lies are not acceptable near allah and fake displays of religiosity are also not accepted by allah So this is why it is necessary that we leave our sins and we stop covering our mistakes with lies. So a person should always give preference to the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over the approval of people. Our ultimate goal should not be to please people that they should be happy with me. No, it should be to gain the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us be more concerned about our image before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than our image before people. So always consider when you do something, when you say something, whether it is to cover up a mistake or it is to present an excuse that is this something that my Lord would accept. would allah approve this behavior of mine and what is the benefit of pleasing people when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with us we learn in a hadith that whoever seeks allah's pleasure by the people's wrath then allah will suffice him from the people and whoever seeks the people's pleasure by allah's wrath then allah will entrust him to the people subhanallah This ayah also shows us that if Allah does not approve of the fasiqeen of those who are defiantly disobedient then we should also not approve of their sins meaning never approve the crimes and the wrong actions of people it doesn't mean that you turn violent against them it means that you don't accept what is wrong you don't call what is wrong right الأعراب أشد كفرا ونفاقا The Bedouins are stronger in disbelief and hypocrisy and more likely to not know the limits of what laws Allah has revealed to his messenger and Allah is knowing and wise Now this is not a bias against people who live in rural areas but the thing is that the people who live in the desert especially at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it meant that they were far from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it meant that they had less access to him and therefore less awareness so we see that being distant from the quran being distant from the sunna means that a person will be ignorant or he will forget what he once knew and that lack of knowledge lack of action lack of good company is something that can create hypocrisy in a person We see in a hadith that two things will never be together in a hypocrite good manners and the understanding of the religion. And we see that the Bedouins because they lived far from communities meaning they lived mostly on their own so we see that being disconnected from people this is also something that is detrimental because people hold you responsible and they also keep you humble. So we see that studying the religion and healthy social interaction whether it is in a religious setting or a worldly setting any it is something that human beings are in need of. 
And we see that there is a kind of softness and courtesy in the people who have knowledge, whether it is worldly or religious knowledge. And there is a kind of crudeness and harshness in the people who have not disciplined themselves with study. So we see that it is not enough to just study on our own even by reading books or doing Google researches. It is essential that we discipline ourselves by being in the company of the people of knowledge, by learning from scholars, by attending the gatherings of knowledge. And among the Bedouins are some who consider what they spend as a loss. Why? Because they don't understand. They don't have that awareness, that knowledge, that when you spend something in the way of Allah, then it is greatly rewardable. And because of that, when they have to spend, when they have to give zakat, they think that it is a fine. And they await for you turns of misfortune. Upon them will be a misfortune of evil. And Allah is hearing and knowing. But we see that all Bedouins, all village dwellers are not the same. So it is said, but among the Bedouins are some who believe in Allah. وَمِنَ الْأَعْرَابِ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ They believe in Allah and in the last day. And they consider what they spend as means of nearness to Allah. قُرُوبَاتٍ عِنْدَ Allah, And of obtaining invocations of the Messenger wasallam. Because when someone would bring charity to the Prophet wasallam, then he would make dua for them. Unquestionably, it is a means of nearness for them. Allah will admit them to His mercy. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So we see that people, individuals are unique. Everyone is not the same. So in any case, it is not correct to stereotype. But since we see in these verses that our environment, it has an impact on our behavior. So it is important to recognize ourselves. Certain individuals, they thrive when they're disconnected from people. They become more productive. They become more devoted and sincere in their worship. But such people are few. Majority of the people need social connection. They need a good environment. Or else they begin to slip. So recognize who you are. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said that whoever has three things in him, Allah will fill his heart with iman. What three things? Companionship of a scholar, recitation of the Qur'an, and fasting. So we see that there are among the Bedouins who live far from the city who are not prone to hypocrisy. So all of them are not the same. There are people who are different. So it is important to recognize what is it that is best for your iman. Which situation, which environment is best for the growth and for the increase of your iman. And we see in this ayah that there are those among them who spend in charity. Why? As a means of drawing close to Allah. And the fact is that sadaqah is a means of drawing close to Allah. Why? Because when you spend for the sake of Allah, and you remind yourself, you know what? This is money that I love. This is money that I'd rather spend on myself. But I will spend this to make Allah pleased with me. Then instantly, this person is trying to make a connection with Allah. And when a person takes one step towards Allah, Allah takes ten steps towards them. So when a person gives sadaqah with sincerity, then definitely it is qurubat. It is something that will connect them, that will bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anytime that you're feeling distant from Allah, then give sadaqah. Remind yourself that you know what? This I'm giving to please Allah. And you will feel closer to Allah. And then we see that the Prophet ﷺ, his way was that whenever somebody brought charity, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for them. Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa said that the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma salli ala ali fulan. That, O oh Allah, send your blessings on the family of so and so. So Ibn Abi Awfa said that when he brought sadaqah at one point, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, send your blessings upon the offspring, on the family of Abu Awfa. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ prayed for the entire family, not just the individual. So we see that when a person gives sadaqah, then their entire family benefits. And if you think about it, would the dua of the Prophet ﷺ not be a means of drawing close to Allah? Of course it would be. So this teaches us that if someone gives you sadaqah or zakat, why? In order that you give it to the poor on their behalf. 
then you shouldn't just say, okay, I'll do this for you. No, you should also make dua for them. Like the Prophet ﷺ prayed for the people who brought charity. Why should you make dua for them? Because remember, the supplication of a brother is answered. Meaning when you have a brother in Islam for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you make dua for them, then that dua is answered. So make dua for your friends, for your friends in faith who are doing good things. Don't just praise them at their face that, oh wow, mashallah, this is so good. No, also make dua for them that may Allah bless you. Barakallahu fikum. And then we see that here, ala إِنَّهَا قُرْبَةٌ لَهُمْ سَيُدْخِلُهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي رَحْمَتِهِ Look at the benefit. Allah will admit them into His mercy. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ And the first forerunners in the faith, among the muhajireen and the ansar, and those who followed them, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ Those who followed them till the day of judgment, how? With good conduct. رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه الله is pleased with them and they are pleased with him and he has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow wherein they will abide forever that is the great attainment so we see in this ayah that وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ and then who is mentioned وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ so the first categories of the people who are the first forerunners in faith Meaning they are ahead. And then there are those who follow them. So who is it that we should follow? We should follow those who are ahead of us. Not those who are slow and lazy in terms of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who were the sabiqun, the first forerunners in Islam, they are an excellent example for us. So we should follow them. But how should we follow them? With ihsan. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ so we see that Allah is pleased with the sabiqun. Even though we see that the quality of ihsan is not mentioned over here for them. So the companions are an excellent example. But the people after them, whether it is the scholars or it is the pious, they're only worthy of being followed in their ihsan. Meaning when they do good, then you take the example of their goodness. And that is what you follow. And what does it mean to follow the companions with ihsan? It means that we believe as they did. That we do good as they did. That we follow them in word and in actions. And then we follow the Qur'an and sunnah as they did. Because صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم We want the path of those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed favor upon. And he indeed bestowed his favor upon them because it is mentioned here that رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن Allah will be pleased with them and they will be pleased with Allah. So if we want Allah to be pleased with us, then we have to do what the companions did. And among those around you of the Bedouins are hypocrites. And also from the people of Medina, they have become accustomed to hypocrisy. SubhanAllah. There are some people who become experts when it comes to deception, when it comes to tricking other people and lying and, you know, harming other people. They become experts in that. You, O Prophet, do not know them. Why? Because they're so good at hiding their reality. They're so good at their hypocrisy. But we know them. And the fact is that Allah knows the real state of the hearts of people. We will punish them twice. How? Once in the grave, and then second, on the day of judgment. Then they will be returned to a great punishment. So the thing is that a person who is trying to hide their hypocrisy, who is trying to hide their true face from people, they don't just attempt once, but they attempt over and over again. There is one lie, and then another lie, and then another story, and then another you know, act of treachery. So because their crime is repeated, this is the reason why the punishment will also be repeated. وَآخَرُونَ اَعْتَرَفُوا بِذُنُوبِهِمْ And there are others who have acknowledged their sins. Meaning, they have come and confessed. They had mixed a righteous deed with another that was bad. Meaning, they're still struggling. 
perhaps Allah will turn to them in forgiveness because they're still trying. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So when they repent, Allah will also be merciful towards them. So this shows us that if we want the forgiveness and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we have to make an actual change. A change of heart is good. But a change in the external, in the actions, is also necessary. What kind of actions should we do? Especially charity, sadaqa. Because remember, sadaqa, especially sadaqa to sir, private charity that you give in secrecy. This is something that cools, that calms the anger of the Lord. خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً Take, O Prophet, from their wealth a charity by which you purify them and cause them increase. تُطَهِرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّهِمْ بِهَا Meaning, this charity will purify them and it will increase them. It will increase them in their ranks. It will take them out of hypocrisy. It will take them towards sincere faith. So we see that hypocrisy is actually removed with righteous action. Especially sadaqa. وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ And invoke Allah's blessings upon them. Indeed, your invocations are reassurance for them. And Allah is hearing and knowing. The fact is that sadaqa certainly purifies. How? It purifies a person's property. And it also purifies the soul of the person. It also cleans the record of a person. We see that, for example, zakat. Zakat actually means purification. Why? Because it purifies the wealth and it causes it to grow. And this is the reason why at the end of Ramadan, on Eid, what do we have to give? We have to give Sadaqatul Fitr. Why do we give Sadaqatul Fitr? Why do we give charity on the day of Eid? We learn in a hadith because it is Tuhrat al It is a means of purification for the fasting person. Because every person who fasts, Yani we can never claim that our fast was perfect. We do things that are useless. We get angry. We sometimes, you know, say things that are inappropriate because we're human. So this is why sadaqa on the day of Eid, what does it do? It purifies any mistake that a person did over the course of the month while a person was fasting. So we see in this ayah that sadaqa certainly purifies a person it purifies a person, meaning their wealth and also their heart, and it also is a means of growth for them. It brings them out of hypocrisy. We see that the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ was truly comforting for the companions. When someone makes dua for you, you feel so happy, right? You feel so good. Now imagine if the Prophet ﷺ is the one making dua for his companions. And we see so many examples where the Prophet ﷺ would pray for blessing in their wealth. And in order to receive his dua, they would be encouraged to give even better things in charity. So, inna salataka sakanul lahum. When you see that someone is struggling in their faith, then yes, you encourage them to do good deeds. But you also make dua for them. Because when they find out that you're making dua for them, then they also feel encouraged. They feel happy. Do they not know that it is Allah who accepts repentance from His servants? Meaning they should be hopeful. They should not despair. وَيَأْخُذُ sadaqat, And He receives charities. So even after sinning, if a person does good, gives sadaqah, to compensate for his sin, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts that. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ And that it is Allah who is the accepting of repentance, the merciful. وَقُلْ اِعْمَلُوا And say, do as you will. For Allah will see your deeds. And so will His Messenger and the believers. And you will be returned to the knower of the unseen and the witnessed. And He will inform you of what you used to do. So your words are not enough now. Your deeds are also important. وَآخَرُونَ مُرْجَوْنَ لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ And there are others deferred until the command of Allah. Meaning their case is pending. Whether He will punish them or whether He will forgive them. And Allah is knowing and wise. So we see that there were different types of people amongst those who were around the Prophet ﷺ. There were those who were sincere, who yes, made a mistake, but then they came out clean, they apologized. And then there were those who lied to cover up their mistakes, who tried to please the Prophet ﷺ with their lies. And then there were those whose matter was deferred, it was postponed until later. And we will learn about that in the coming verses.
And then there are those hypocrites who took for themselves a mosque. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ضِرَارًا They made a mosque. Why? In order to cause harm. They built a masjid to harm the religion in the guise of piety. You see, when the Prophet ﷺ was heading to Tabuk, the hypocrites made a mosque. And they said, they made the excuse that, you know, some people are old and sick and they cannot reach Masjid Quba, so we want to make our own over here. And the purpose was to actually make it as headquarters for planning their attacks on the Muslims. And they wanted to ensure that no one would be suspicious of them. So this is why they said, it's a masjid. So the objective of the so-called masjid was not to facilitate worship, but it was to cause harm to the Muslims. So yes, there are people who are actually wolves, but they come in the guise of friends. And for disbelief, meaning instead of worshipping Allah, what did they want to do in that so-called mosque? They wanted to engage in sinful actions over there. And also to create division among the believers because they made a masjid in parallel to Masjid Quba. And as a station for whoever had warred against Allah and his messenger before. This was Abu Amir al-Rahib, who was a man from Medina. But after the Prophet ﷺ came, this man was so angry that he left for Makkah. He joined the mushrikeen and he urged them to fight the Muslims. And now he was working with these hypocrites to harm the Muslims again. And we see that now his plans failed and eventually he went towards Rome to incite them against the Prophet ﷺ. But he died on the journey. And they will surely swear, we intended only the best and Allah testifies that indeed they're liars. We see that they asked the Prophet ﷺ to come and pray in that so-called masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ said that on my return from Tabuk, I will pray over there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses to His Messenger that you are not going to go there. So it is said, do not stand within it ever. A mosque that is founded on piety, on righteousness from the first day. And this is referring to the Masjid Quba. That is more worthy for you to stand in. Within it are men who love to purify themselves and Allah loves those who purify themselves. Subhanallah. This is so amazing. Masjid Quba was built on taqwa of Allah. It was constructed so that people would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was built with sincerity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the people who attended Masjid Quba. And what is the specific praise? That they clean themselves, they purify themselves. Remember that purification is needed, not just on the external that we clean our bodies. Purification is also needed in the heart. That our intentions must be sincere. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising these people for. That they purify themselves. They clean themselves. And the thing is that a person who is concerned about purifying themselves, they don't like filth. It's a lifestyle. They don't like bad smells. Whether it is in the mouth, or it is on the body, or it is in the clothes, or it is in the heart. So we should be concerned about cleaning ourselves at all of these levels. We see that the people of Quba, they were asked that how come you are praised in this way? What is it that you do? And they said that we clean ourselves on using the bathroom. Remember that there are three ways of you know, cleaning one's private part after using the bathroom. One way is that you just use, you know, stones or something dry like toilet paper to remove the filth completely. And if you manage to remove the filth completely with something like this, it is permissible. This is called istijmar. But then there's a better way, which is istinja, which is to wash with water. And then there's another way, which is to do istijmar and istinja, which is to wipe thoroughly and then wash thoroughly. And this is what the people of Quba would do. Remember that at that time, water was scarce. It was not as easily available as it is for many of us today. So the people of Quba at times will go to great lengths in order to make sure that they were completely clean. And this is something that earned them the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes, especially when we're fasting, we have to exert a lot of effort to make sure that our mouth is clean. You know, you don't just brush your teeth in the morning and in the evening, but you do miswak, you know, you floss your teeth. You go to great lengths over and over again. And sometimes this can feel very burdensome. But don't get annoyed by this. Because mutahirin are those who 
purify themselves. So when a person is constantly exerting effort to clean themselves, whether it is their heart, or it is their body, or it is their you know mouth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes this effort. And this is effort that will be rewarded by Allah. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَّهِرِينَ Allah loves those who purify themselves. We see that the Prophet ﷺ said that there are five acts which conform to the pure fitrah. Circumcision, removing of the pubic hair, clipping the nails, plucking the underarm hair, and trimming the mustache. SubhanAllah, our religion guides us to such basic things as well. Because when you clean your body, then this is something that makes you used to cleanliness. And then you are not okay with a corrupt intention. Then a corrupt intention will bother you. Then you will purify your heart as well. That as soon as a feeling of riya comes about in the heart, of showing off comes about in the heart, you say, Arudu billah, no, I'm not doing this for the people. I'm doing this for Allah. Then it is said, then is one who laid the foundation of his building on righteousness out of fear of Allah and seeking his approval better or one who laid the foundation of his building on the edge of a bank about to collapse. So it collapsed with him into the fire of hell. Look at the contrast between Masjid Quba and Masjid Dirar. One was built on piety and the other is built at the edge of a cliff. Which one is going to last? Which one is going to make it to the hereafter? And which one is going to end up in hell? And Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Their building, which they built, will not cease to be a cause of skepticism in their hearts until their hearts are stopped and Allah is knowing and wise. Meaning they will continue to be in doubt until they leave this world. So we see that the external of a righteous action will not benefit a person until the foundation is also sincere. A small deed, if it is done with sincerity, it can save a person from hell. This is why we are told, اِتَّقُنَّارُ That save yourselves from the fire, even if it is with half of a date. Something so small can save you, if it's done with sincerity. And a big deed, like huge sadaqah, jihad, with corrupt intention, it can become a cause for falling in hellfire. We see that in a hadith we learned that there are three kinds of people who recite the Qur'an. There is the believer, there is the hypocrite, and there is the fajr, the sinful. So one of the narrators, he asked his teacher that who are these three? So he explained that the hypocrite denies it. Meaning yes, even though he's reciting it in his heart, he actually denies it. He listens to it, okay, he's learning about it, but in his heart he is denying it. There's no iman in the heart. The wicked eats by it. Meaning the sinful person only uses the Qur'an to his advantage so that he can get some material benefit out of it. And the believer believes in it. So based on the intention will be the result. We see that on the Day of Judgment, a person will be called. And he will say that, you know what? I learned the book of Allah. I recited it. And Allah will say to him that you are lying. You did it so that you were called a reciter, a qari. And you were called a qari. You got your result in the dunya, your reward in the dunya. And now there's nothing for you. So he will be thrown in hell. So we should not just be concerned about the outward aspect of our actions. We need to look at the intention and we need to purify it again and again. You know, just as you purify your body again and again. You clean your mouth again and again. You need to clean your heart again and again also. Then it is said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ بِأَنَّ لَهُمُ الْجَنَّةِ Indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their properties in exchange for that they will have paradise. Meaning their life is for Allah. They have sold their lives and their wealths, their properties to Allah. This means that they don't live as they desire, but they live in a way that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At times, we fall into great deception. We think that the goal of life is to be happy. So do what pleases you. Live in a way that makes you happy. But the fact is that we were not created to worship our desire. We were not created to pursue our passions. We were created to worship Allah. So the believers, they have sold their lives and their properties to Allah. So now it is not about what they wish. It is all about what Allah wishes. And this is why they fight in the cause of Allah. 
So they kill and are killed. It is a true promise binding upon him in the Torah and the Injil and the Quran. And who is truer to his covenant than Allah? So rejoice in your transaction, which you have contracted. And it is that which is the great attainment. This contract that you have made, rejoice over it. Because this is going to bring you great success. What an honorable contract this is. Look at who the buyer is. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at what is being bought. It is the best that people have, their life and their property. Look at what is being given in exchange, Jannah. Look at where this transaction is recorded. It is recorded in the Quran, in the Torah, in the Injil, in Revelation. Look at the witness to this trade, to this contract. It is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So could there be any doubt about the benefit of this contract? The value of this contract? Wa'adan alayhi haqqa. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna sil'at Allahi ghaliyah. Inna sil'at Allahi al-jannah. Know that the bargain with Allah is very expensive. It is very precious. It is jannah. So remember, jannah is not cheap. It is not for free. The area of Jannah that is covered by a whip is far better than the world and whatever that is in it. But still, our deeds and sacrifices are not enough to buy Jannah with. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, none can enter paradise through his good deeds. So it is only his favor that he is giving us a chance to earn something huge with the little that we have. So value your life. And use your wealth in good causes so that you can get Jannah in return from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are the terms and conditions for this bargain? It was mentioned earlier that such people fight in the way of Allah. But this is not always possible for everybody. So now what? At-ta'ibun, al-abidun. Such believers are at-ta'ibun, the repentant. At-ta'ibun is a noun. It is not a verb. Meaning, there are those who, there are people who habitually repent. They're always repenting from all sins, leaving their sins, big ones and small ones, asking Allah for forgiveness at all times, out of fear that this contract might get cancelled, it might get nullified. We learn in a hadith that every child of Adam errs, and the best of those who err are those who seek forgiveness. So it begins with at-ta'ibun. Those who repent. Because whenever you think about Jannah, whenever you think about the rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, when you think about the high levels of success, you think, oh, but I'm not worthy of that. Yes, we're not worthy of that. Because our deeds are not perfect. Our sins are many. This is why. At-ta'ibun. Those who repent. And then al-abidun, those who worship, the worshippers who are consistent in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, performing what is due on them. Whether it is wajibat, obligations, or the recommended acts of worship, whether it is salah, or qiyam, or the recitation of Qur'an, or reflection upon it, remembrance of Allah, you need, they're always in a state of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether things are easy, or they're hard, whether they're at home, or they're traveling, Al-Abidun, Al-Hamidun, the praisers of Allah. Meaning there are those who are grateful. They're grateful to Allah in ease and in hardship. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. All praise to Allah in every situation. And only a Hamid can do this. Who is a Hamid? A person who consistently praises and thanks Allah. Why? Because he is able to see the blessings of Allah and appreciate the blessings of Allah. Such a person is able to acknowledge the apparent blessings and the hidden blessings. So he praises Allah for Allah's favors. They do hamd in the heart, on their tongues, in conversation, during the day and during the night, when things are easy and when things are tough. Alhamidun. Asaihun, the travelers, meaning those who travel, not for the gram, so that they can take all those fancy pictures and post them. No. Asaihun, those who travel for the sake of Allah. And what is that? This is traveling in order to seek knowledge, in order to strive in the way of Allah. For example, Hajj and Umrah, in order to meet relatives. 
Because remember, when you meet your relatives, and yes, it can be very expensive at times, but when you travel to meet your relatives so that you can be good to them, you can join relationships, then this is also traveling for the sake of Allah. And every dollar that you spend, remember, it did not go waste. It is not a waste. When you travel for the sake of Allah, then that journey is rewardable. Traveling for darwah, to call people to Allah. Traveling to see the wonders of Allah's creation. Traveling to earn a lawful income. Asa'ihun, meaning they're not just living in their comfort, in their homes. They go out for the cause of Allah to earn Allah's approval. Or asa'ihun also means those who fast. And those who fast consistently. Al-Raki'oon, those who bow. As-Sajidun, and those who prostrate. Meaning they make sajda in prayer. And this means that they pray a lot. Because rukur and sajda can only be done a lot when a person prays a lot. Think about it. In just two rak'ah salah, right? There are two rukurs and four sajdas. So al-raki'oon, as-sajidun, the Prophet wasallam said that when a servant stands for prayer, he comes with his sins and they're placed on his shoulders. So each time that he does rukur or sujood, his sins fall from him. His sins fall from him. So unburden yourself. And in the month of Ramadan, especially when it comes to the night prayer, when it comes to taraweeh or it comes to qiyamul layl, then don't be lazy in that. Every two rakar, encourage yourself that I want to be among al-raki'oon, as-sajidoon, because salah is not a burden. Yes, it can be physically tiring, but just as, you know, honey is sweet on the tongue, worship is sweet in the heart, even though it can be difficult on the limbs. You know, for example, if you put honey in your eyes, it will sting, it will burn. But when you eat it, it's so delicious. And just like that worship, it can be very hard on the body, very painful. But there's a certain joy and a certain pleasure that you experience in the heart, which can only be there by worship. So rukur and sajda are mentioned over here, even though they're part of ibadah. But this shows us that they do a lot of rukur, a lot of sajda. Al-amiruna bil ma'roof, those who enjoin what is right. Wanahuna anil munkar, and they forbid what is wrong. Because what is worth believing, what is worth having, what is worth doing, is worth sharing. Walhafiruna li hududillah, and those who observe the limits set by Allah. Meaning they do not fall into what is unlawful. But wherever Allah has stopped them, meaning Allah has set a boundary, then they stop over there. So for example, now it is time to stop eating, stop eating. Now it is time to break your fast, so now start eating. وَالْحَافِظُونَ لِحُدُودِ اللَّهِ They respect and guard the boundaries that Allah has set, whether it is with regards to speech, or it is with regard to food and drink, or relationships, or actions. And once they know the hudud, they respect them. وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And give good tidings to the believers, that when they will do this, Allah will fulfill His promise to them. Allah will give them jannah. And remember, Allah's promise is true. He doesn't go against it, nor is he weak to fulfill it. So sometimes it is true that these actions can be hard on the nafs, but be glad, don't be sad. It is not for the Prophet and those who have believed to ask forgiveness for the polytheists, even if they were relatives, after it has become clear to them that they are companions of the fire. And the request of forgiveness of Ibrahim for his father was only because of a promise he had made to him. But when it became apparent to Ibrahim that his father was an enemy to Allah because he died in that disbelief, then he dissociated himself from him. Indeed was Ibrahim compassionate and patient, meaning he was very sincere towards all. So we see here that as long as a non-Muslim, whether they're relative or friend, as long as they're alive, you pray for them. And you must pray for them. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens His doors of blessings upon them so that they're led towards guidance. But once they die upon that disbelief, then it is not permissible for us to seek forgiveness for them. And this is where we have to align our preferences, our love with the preferences of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith we learn that whoever gives for the sake of Allah, withholds for the sake of Allah, loves for the sake of Allah, and also dislikes for the sake of Allah, and even gets married for the sake of Allah, then such a person has perfected their iman. 
And Allah would not let a people stray after He has guided them until He makes clear to them what they should avoid. Indeed, Allah is knowing of all things. This is Allah's guidance and mercy. Indeed, to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He gives life and causes death. And you have not besides Allah any protector or any helper. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ Allah has already forgiven the Prophet and the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Who are they? الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاعَةِ الْعُسْرَى Those who followed the Prophet wasallam in the hour of difficulty. سَاعَةُ الْعُسْرَى This was Tabuk. This army was called Jayshu al-Usra because this was truly a very difficult journey. You see, performing good deeds when things are easy, when a person is healthy, when there's wealth, when there's security, that is understandable. And yes, mashallah, it is excellent that a person, you know, gives charity, that a person prays, that a person, you know, supports good causes. That is really good. But when things are tough, really tough, and tough not just in one aspect of life, but in every aspect. So for example, a person struggling financially or physically or socially. And this is something that we can relate with very well these days because of the current pandemic. In a time like this, supporting a good cause, that a person is not just selfishly looking out for themselves, but they're also concerned about others and especially the religion of Allah, then this is a proof of their honesty. This is a proof of their commitment. So the companions, they proved their commitment. And what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardoned them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. Especially this was at a time that after the hearts of a party of them had almost inclined to doubt. Meaning there were some people who almost did not go, but they still went forth. So initially there was hesitation, but then they went. So mataba alayhim, and then he forgave them. Why? Because they did not listen to their nafs. They still strove hard. And they obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّهُ بِهِمْ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Indeed, He was to them kind and merciful. So it is very important for us that we don't just do good things when they're convenient. We should do what is right. We should do what is good. Even if at times it is difficult for us. It is difficult on the nafs. So we should obey Allah. We should do good despite our personal difficulty. And you know what? Very soon, inshallah, with the help of Allah, you will overcome that difficulty. If we only obey the nafs, the soul, the desire, then we will sell ourselves short. We cannot accomplish much in our lives. It is said that when you think you are done, meaning when you think that you have reached your maximum potential, that you cannot work any harder, the fact is that you are only at 40% of what your body is capable of doing. Meaning, you have the potential to go further. So most of the time, the fact is that we sell ourselves short. So it is necessary that we push ourselves, that we go the extra mile, you know, we strive a little bit, and the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also come. Because فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى Allah will not leave you in difficulty. He will give you ease also. Then we see here that difficult circumstances are actually an opportunity. Because there was Sa'atul Usra, an hour of difficulty, but it also brought about forgiveness and mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when things are tough, do what you can. And expect the best outcome. Expect the best reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has not put you in hardship to make things difficult for you, but to increase you in your rewards. We learn in a hadith that a person has a certain rank near Allah, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to reach a certain level. And that person cannot reach that level just by their good work. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them in hardship, in a test, in a difficulty. So they experience something painful. And then there's a financial loss. And then there's sad news. And then there's fear. And then there's illness. And one test after the other. And because of his patience, he reaches the reward, the level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to reach. So do not despair. Because no difficulty is permanent. For the believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him ease. And also remember that the person who remembers Allah in times of difficulty, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will certainly bestow his forgiveness and mercy upon them as we see in this ayah.
And he also forgave the three who were left behind. Meaning their repentance was not immediately accepted. Their matter was left behind. It was deferred. And now, eventually, their matter was decided. And what was the decision? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardoned them. Who are these people? These were three companions who remained behind from the expedition of Tabuk. They intended to go out, but they just delayed. And they ended up missing the entire expedition. And this is something that happens with us also. We keep saying, you know what? Maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. We procrastinate. And then we know it is too late. So for example, it is only a few days into the month of Ramadan. And some of us are still thinking, yes, I will recite the Quran tomorrow. Inshallah. Tonight, inshallah. We keep delaying. Don't delay until you lose the opportunity. Because this is what happened with these companions. They kept delaying until it was too late. They couldn't join the Prophet ﷺ. So when the Prophet ﷺ returned, we see that the hypocrites, they came lying and taking false oaths. And there were some other people who didn't even bother to apologize. But these three companions, they went and they admitted their fault. They didn't lie. They admitted that it was their own laziness and that if they wanted, they could have pleased the Prophet ﷺ with lies. But they knew that Allah would not be pleased. So what happened? Their matter was deferred. To the point that it was 40 days. And in those 40 days, the companions were told to boycott them completely. So no one would speak to them. And their state, their condition is described over here. That they were left behind to the point that the earth closed in on them in spite of its vastness and their souls confined them. You see, social distancing, this was social distancing in the real sense because no one spoke to them. When they looked at the Prophet ﷺ, he wouldn't smile at them. Can you imagine? Loneliness is something very difficult. Social isolation, solitary confinement is actually a form of punishment. And they experienced that. And they were certain that there is no refuge from Allah except in Him. So they held on. They didn't lie. Then what happened? He turned to them so that they could repent. Indeed, Allah is the accepting of repentance, the merciful. The fact is that they understood that there is no place where a person can find shelter or security by running away from Allah. They were certain that there is no refuge from Allah except to Allah. We cannot run away from Him. There is no getting upset with Allah. There is no avoiding Allah. We have to return to Allah in every state of ours. In a hadith we learn, Allah says, Oh my servants, all of you are astray except those whom I guide. So seek guidance of me, I shall guide you. Oh my servants, all of you are hungry except those whom I feed. So seek food from me and I shall feed you. Oh my servants, all of you are naked except those whom I have clothed. So seek clothing from me and I shall clothe you. Oh my servants, you commit sins by day and by night. And I forgive sins. So seek forgiveness from me and I shall forgive you. So don't turn away from Allah. Turn towards Allah. What is the lesson? Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. All you who have believed, ittaqullah, fear Allah, wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen, and be with those who are righteous. Ka'ab radiallahu anhu, who was one of the three companions, he said himself that the greatest blessing of Allah on me after Islam was a tawfiq, the ability to speak the truth. Otherwise, I too would have been destroyed as others were destroyed because of their lying. He held on to the truth, even though it was so hard. He stuck with the truthful, even though they had boycotted him. But he did not join the side of the liars, even though he could lie. So no matter how hard it is, still speak the truth. Then it is said, it was not proper for the people of Medina and those surrounding them of the Bedouins that they remain behind after the departure of the Messenger of Allah or that they prefer themselves over his self. This is because they are not afflicted by thirst or fatigue or hunger in the cause of Allah, nor do they tread on any ground that enrages the disbelievers, nor do they inflict upon an enemy any infliction, but that is registered for them as a righteous deed. Subhanallah. Indeed, in Allah la yudhiru ajr al muhsinin. Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of the doers of good. Remember, the reward for a good deed begins from the moment that a person intends to do it. We learn in a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّكُمْ فِي صَلَاةٍ 
من تضرتموها You have been in prayer as long as you have been waiting for it. So from the moment that a person intends to pray and then they're waiting for it, it is as if they are in prayer. They start receiving the reward of salah. And the reward for every deed we see is in proportion to the effort that you exert in it. There are some people, mashallah, they fast very easily, they have no problem. And then there are those who get hungry, they get headaches. Subhanallah, it is so hard for them to fast. So we see in this ayah that for every moment of thirst and fatigue and hunger and step that a person takes in the way of Allah, a good deed is recorded for them. What you spend in the way of Allah, you are rewarded for that also. The Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha radiallahu anha in her umrah that there is reward equal to your hardship and your spending. Meaning whatever amount you spend for the umrah and whatever hardship you bear, whatever fatigue you experience, you will be rewarded for that. So remember, bearing difficulty in the way of Allah is not just an expiation of sins. It also brings reward. Now this doesn't mean that we make worship difficult for ourselves on purpose. No, we should create ease for ourselves. But sometimes, despite every effort, things are hard. So those who do ihsan, who consistently do good, they don't mind bearing hardship for the sake of Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not waste their reward. So there are times when a person is not able to continue the good that they were doing before. Like for example, a person used to go to the masjid in the month of Ramadan for every salah regularly, even though it was so hard, but they made a point to go. And now that they're not able to go, inshallah, their reward is still being recorded. Why? Because in a hadith we learn that when a person is unwell, when a servant is unwell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels that write for him the good deeds that he used to do. Because I know that when he will be released from his illness, he will continue. Meaning the only reason why he's not doing those good deeds right now is because of his inability. It's a temporary situation. So, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And a person is rewarded for what they habitually do, for what they regularly do. We learn that when a person is sick or they travel, then their reward for qiyam is written, which they would do when they were healthy and while they were at home. And remember that there is reward even for a good intention. So don't be stingy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. Be eager for those rewards. Nor do they spend an expenditure small or large or cross a valley, but that it is registered for them. That Allah may reward them for the best of what they were doing. So we see that Allah accepts the deeds of His servants, the big and the small ones. Alhamdulillah, we completed the part one and part two. Inshallah, uh, we will take a five minutes break. We'll see you all after five minutes. Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wala ilaha illallah Wallahu akbar Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wala ilaha illallah Wallahu akbar Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wala ilaha illallah Wallahu akbar Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wala Subhanallah Walhamdulillah Wala ilaha illallah Wallahu 
أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر سبحان الله والحمد لله ولا وما كان المؤمنون لينفروا كافة. And it is not for the believers to go forth to battle all at once. So we see that Tabuk was an exceptional situation. Because for there should separate from every division of them a group remaining to obtain understanding in their religion and warn their people when they return to them that they might be cautious. Subhanallah. Going out to learn, dedicating yourself to study the religion of Allah and then teaching it to people. This is what is being encouraged over here. We think the only way of striving in the way of Allah is to pick up weapons. But what is it that we learn in hadith? That opening up a book, sitting in front of a teacher, studying, working hard in learning, taking those tests, studying like this, this is important. Because just as people are needed to defend the borders, why? So that communities are safe. We also need individuals to learn and teach sacred knowledge. Why? For the spiritual safety of our communities. People need officers to guard them, and people also need religious scholars to teach them, to help them learn. This is a need in every community. So we see that seeking religious knowledge and then teaching it, this is something that is truly noble. In a hadith we learn that two people were mentioned before the Prophet ﷺ. One of them was a worshipper and the other was a scholar. So the Prophet ﷺ said that the superiority of the scholar over the worshipper is like my superiority over the least of you. Can you imagine the difference between the Prophet ﷺ and an ordinary person from this ummah, the least of this ummah? Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed Allah, His angels, the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth, even the ant in its hole, and the fish, they send blessings, they pray for the one who teaches the people to do good. So you see, one is that a person prays for himself. How much can he pray for himself? How much dua can you make for yourself? But the other is that when you benefit other people, when you teach them good things, 
Now what's going to happen? So many people are also going to pray for you. So yes, make time for worship, but also make time to learn the religion and share this goodness. So remember, knowledge is not just something that we acquire, but we should also strengthen our knowledge and then pass on what we have learned. Otherwise, we are wasting ourselves. And it really does not befit a person to do that. We learn that the example of the one who learns knowledge but then does not spread it is like the one who hoards a treasure. Imagine a person who has a huge treasure, gold and silver, lots of money, but then he does not spend from it. What a loss. And he has so much money and he's not spending from it. Neither is he investing it to increase in his knowledge, nor is he spending it on himself to make his life easy. So likewise, a person who has knowledge, but then they don't teach it to others, then they're doing themselves a disservice. They're selling themselves short. We learn that whoever teaches a verse of the book of Allah, one ayah of the Qur'an, he will receive its reward as long as it is recited. So be eager for this treasure. O oh, you who have believed, fight those adjacent to you of the disbelievers and let them find in you harshness and know that Allah is with the righteous. And whenever a surah is revealed, there are among the hypocrites those who say, which of you has this increased in faith? Meaning they make fun of the Qur'an. That did it really make a difference? As for those who believed, it has increased them in faith while they're rejoicing. But as for those in whose hearts is disease, it has only increased them in evil. In addition to their evil, meaning they don't benefit at all, they only get worse and they will have died while they're disbelievers. So remember, the Quran increases the believers in their faith. And it increases hypocrites in their hypocrisy. You might wonder, how could the Qur'an increase a person in hypocrisy? Because if you think about it, if there is a bin with rotting garbage inside of it, and you pour a jug of the purest fruit juice, which is packed with vitamins and all the good things, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Is it going to become better? No, it's only going to rot. In fact, it's going to become worse than before. This is why we learn that Mujahid and Qatada, they said that no one sits with the Qur'an except that he gets up with either increase or loss. Either you increase or you lose more. This is Allah's decree that He has made that the Qur'an is a healing and mercy for the believers and it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Then it is said, do they not see that they are tried every year once or twice? The hypocrites. Yani the incident of Tabuk, it exposed their reality. Do they not see that every year there is some kind of hardship, some kind of test, which makes them recognize their trickery, their deceit, but then they do not repent, nor do they remember? You see, when we make mistakes, when we are in hardship, we are given a chance to look at ourselves in the mirror. And at that time, we have two options. Either admit your weakness and now work on improving yourself, there should be introspection or a person denies it and says, you know what, I'm perfectly fine. Everybody else is at fault. So the hypocrites don't improve. Difficult circumstances are moments of introspection, not entertainment and distraction. And whenever a surah is revealed, they look at each other saying, does anyone see you? Why? Because they're bored. And then they dismiss themselves, meaning they slip away, they leave quietly. Allah has dismissed their hearts because there are people who do not understand. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ There has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourselves. Grievous to him is what you suffer. He is concerned over you and to the believers is kind and merciful. This was the Prophet ﷺ. What a beautiful, what a great, excellent leader. He was eager to save people from hell. He said, my example and the example of the people is that of a man who made a fire and when it lighted what was around it, moths and other insects started falling into the fire. So the man tried his best to prevent them from falling into the fire, but they overpowered him and they rushed into the fire. So the Prophet ﷺ said, now similarly, I take hold of the knots at your waist, meaning I'm trying to grab you to prevent you from falling into the fire, but you insist on falling into it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he worked so hard, he tried so hard to save people from hell. And he was so eager to even give up his own comfort, his personal comfort, 
in order to benefit the ummah. We learned that once the Prophet ﷺ was fasting, he was taking a nap. And at that time, a janazah had to be performed. So the people did not wake him up. And they went and buried that lady. And later on, when the Prophet ﷺ saw the grave, that it was fresh, he asked that, who is this? So they told him. So he asked that, why didn't you wake me? They said that you were resting. So he said that you should have informed me. You should have told me. Next time, he said, لا تفعلوا. لا تفعلوا. Don't do that again. If I'm ever resting and a janazah has to be performed, call me. So the Prophet ﷺ then went to the grave and then he prayed for the lady who was in the grave. The Prophet ﷺ was very considerate, very, very empathetic. He said that when I begin the prayer, I intend to make it long, but then I hear a child crying. And I shortened the salah because of his mother's feelings. Subhanallah. And what were his du'as? He would pray, Allahumma ummati, ummati, oh Allah, my umma, my umma. He reserved his prayer, his special dua for the hereafter so that he can intercede for his umma. At one occasion we learn that Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Ya Rasulullah make dua for me. So he prayed, oh Allah forgive her for her earlier sins and later sins and what she did in private and in public. So Aisha radiallahu anha was so happy she started laughing and she put her head in the lap of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He asked, did my dua make you happy? She said, why would it not make me happy? He said, by Allah, this is my dua for my ummah in every prayer of mine. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted for his ummah. This is how he was towards his ummah. So how should we be? Allah says, فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا But if they turn away, فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ You should say, sufficient for me is Allah. There is no deity except Him. On Him I have relied, and He is the Lord of the great throne. Meaning if they turn away, then they're turning away. They're abandoning you is not going to harm you because Allah will be enough for you. Now there is a fabricated narration in which we learn that it is said that whoever says this statement seven times in the morning and seven times in the evening, it will suffice him against all worries. But this narration is not authentic. There is no sound evidence for this report. However, this statement is certainly very empowering. It is a positive affirmation. So any time that you feel rejected by people, that for example, you call people to something good, but they reject you. You invite them to something good and they reject you. So you feel very sad. You feel alone and you also feel afraid. So at a time like this, say, حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ That Allah is enough for me. On Him I put my trust. And He is the Lord of the throne. So His treasures are vast. What I need is with Him. You know, sometimes people get very disappointed when there's a prospective, you know, proposal for marriage and then it doesn't work. They feel so rejected that, you know what, I feel like nobody wants me. No, at that time, say Hasbi Allah. Because you know what? Allah told His Messenger to say Hasbi Allah la ilaha illahu. Alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshi al-azim. So say it. Say it any time that you want. And say it as many times as you want. Because if it was good for the Prophet ﷺ to say, then this will also be beneficial for us to say. Surah Yunus. Surah Yunus is a Makki surah. And like many Makki surahs, it mentions in detail the proofs of the oneness of Allah, the resurrection, prophethood, and other matters related to faith. We see that Surah Tawbah ends with the mention of the Prophet ﷺ. And Surah Yunus begins with his mention also. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را These are the verses of the wise book. Have the people been amazed that we revealed revelation to a man from among them saying, warn mankind and give good tidings to those who believe that they will have a firm precedence of honor with their Lord? Subhanallah. The Quran gives such good news that those who believe will have قدم الصدق with their Lord. What is qadam al sidiqin A position of honor. Can you imagine? A position of honor near Allah. A position of honor that is certain, that is yani, real and permanent from which is no decline. A reward that is excellent for the deeds that they have sent ahead. So keep doing good. But the disbelievers say, indeed, this is an obvious magician. Indeed, your Lord is Allah, who created the heavens and the earth in six days and then established himself above the throne. 
arranging the matter of his creation. There is no intercessor except after his permission. That is Allah, your Lord. So worship him. Then will you not remember? To him is your return all together. It is the promise of Allah, which is truth. Indeed, he begins the process of creation and then repeats it that he may reward those who have believed and done righteous deeds. Bil qist in justice. Because if you just look at this world, yani it's very obvious that this world is not complete. It's not completely fair. There has to be a sequel. There has to be a second chapter where it will complete the story. And this is why the Day of Judgment is there, to give people what they deserve. Bil qist. But those who disbelieved will have a drink of scalding water and a painful punishment for what they used to deny. It is he who made the sun a shining light and the moon a derived light and determined for it phases that you may know the number of years and account of time. Allah has not created this except in truth. He details the signs for people who know. لِقَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ This is why it's so important for us to learn. Not just religious texts, but we should also learn about the creation that Allah has created. Yani, you see the moon, the sun is mentioned over here. Account of time is mentioned over here. But this knowledge should always be in the right context. It should always be with the realization that Allah is the creator. And this is when such knowledge will be beneficial to a person. It will be a means of increase in faith. Indeed, in the alternation of the night and the day, and in what Allah has created in the heavens and the earth, are signs for people who fear Allah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ لِقَاءَنَا Indeed, those who do not expect the meeting with us وَرَضُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا And are satisfied with the life of this world وَطُمَأَنُّوا بِهَا And they feel secure therein وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا غَافِلُونَ And those are heedless of our signs. What will happen to such people? For those, their refuge will be the fire because of what they used to earn. Look at the loss in being satisfied only with this world, in thinking that this world is everything. So do whatever because YOLO, you live only once. And if you don't have fun, then you will miss out. So a person should not make this world their ultimate concern. Because remember, forgetting the hereafter and making this world your ultimate concern is only going to bring loss upon loss. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever makes the world his most important matter, Allah will confound his affairs and make poverty appear before his eyes. And he will not get anything from the world except what has been decreed for him. But whoever makes the hereafter his most important matter, Allah will settle his affairs and make him content in his heart and the world will come to him, although he does not even want it. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Indeed, those who have believed and done righteous deeds, يَهْدِيهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِإِيمَانِهِمْ Their Lord will guide them because of their faith. Look at the contrast. Allah will guide them because of their iman. Beneath them, rivers will flow in the gardens of pleasure. Meaning Allah will guide them to Jannah. Their call therein will be, سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمْ Exalted are you, O Allah. And their greeting therein will be, Salam, peace. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَاهُمْ And the last of their call will be, أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That prays to Allah, Lord of the worlds. These are the grateful servants of Allah. Those who are grateful in this life, Alhamidun, And those who are grateful to Allah, praising and thanking Allah in Jannah also. اللَّهُمَّ جِعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ so we see in these verses that because of iman, a person is guided to doing good things in this life. And on the day of judgment, because of iman, a person will be guided. They will be led to jannah. This is why we say, ihdina, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. And as sirat al-mustaqim, yes, it is in this life. But remember, there is also a sirat on the day of judgment, which is over hellfire, which all of us have to cross. So how is it that we can cross that bridge to Jannah when we have iman? So remember, because of iman, a person will have istiqama. A person will have steadfastness in their religion. Because of their iman, because of their faith, they will be able to cross that bridge safely. But remember, iman doesn't just mean that a person says, I believe. 
For iman, a person must have knowledge. A person must increase in their awareness. A person must act upon that knowledge. There must be ilm and amal. This is why hidayah, guidance, includes both. Hidayah irshad and hidayah tawfiq, which means there is knowledge and there is action. This is why the companions would say that we learned iman, then we learned the Qur'an, and as a result of that, we increased in our iman. So remember, knowledge increases a person in iman because knowledge leads to action. This is why we see that in the grave also, a person will have peace because of their iman and good deeds. The example of the believer we learn in a hadith with respect to his death is like a person who has three friends. One is his wealth. So it says, take whatever you wish. The second says, I am with you, but when you die, I will leave you. Meaning this is his family. And the third says, I am with you. This is his actions. I will go with you and I will rise with you. Because the thing is that when a person goes to their grave, their wealth, it will not benefit them. Their family also will not stay with them. What is it that will bring comfort to a person in their grave? It is their good deeds. And we see that on the day of judgment also. As soon as a person will be resurrected, guidance to paradise will begin. Ibn Juraid said that this will be on the day of judgment when a person will come out of his grave. He will be greeted by his deeds that will appear to him in a very beautiful, pleasing, fragrant form. So he will ask, who are you? So that person will say, I am your deeds. So it will shine a light for him until he will enter Jannah. يَهْدِيهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِإِيمَانِهِمْ And if Allah was to hasten for the people, the evil they invoke, as He hastens for them the good, their term would have been ended for them. But we leave the ones who do not expect the meeting with us in their transgression, wandering blindly, meaning without any hardship in their life. And when affliction touches man, he calls upon us, whether lying on his side or sitting or standing. But when we remove from him his affliction, he continues in disobedience as if he had never called upon us to remove an affliction that touched him. Thus is made pleasing to the transgressors that which they have been doing. This is very selfish. And this is a mistake that unfortunately many people make. Our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shouldn't be such that only when we desperately need something, then we remember Him. And then when things are good, we forget about Him. Yes, of course, there should be an increase in worship when things are difficult, but it should not be completely absent in good times. Because تَعَرَّفْ إِلَيْهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ Recognize and acknowledge Allah in times of ease, meaning remember Him in prosperity, and He will remember you in times of adversity. And we had already destroyed generations before you when they wronged. And their messengers had come to them with clear proofs. But they were not to believe. Thus do we recompense the criminal people. Then we made you successors in the land after them, so that we may observe how you will do. And when our verses are recited to them as clear evidences, those who do not expect the meeting with us say, bring us a Qur'an other than this or change it. They just don't like the Qur'an. They'd rather follow something else. It's like, you know, they want to believe, but they don't want to. So they say, please change it. Say, it is not for me to change it on my own accord. I only follow what is revealed to me. Indeed, I fear if I should disobey my Lord, the punishment of a tremendous day. Say, if Allah had willed, I would would not have recited it to you, nor would he have made it known to you. For I had remained among you a lifetime before, then will you not reason? Meaning this is clearly from Allah, it's not from me. So who is more unjust than he who invents a lie about Allah or denies his signs? Indeed, the criminals will not succeed. Now their shirk is being mentioned. And they worship other than Allah, that which neither harms them nor benefits them. And they say, these are our intercessors with Allah. SubhanAllah, so many people, you know, they will call upon someone other than Allah. Why? With the same justification. That, you know what, we try to please them so that they will intercede on our behalf. Say, do you inform Allah of something he does not even know in the heavens or the earth? Meaning, are you trying to tell Allah about something that doesn't exist? Exalted is he and high above what they associate with him. And mankind was not but one community. Meaning everybody was upon 
the worship of Allah alone. But then they differed. And if not for a word that proceeded from your Lord, it would have been judged between them immediately concerning that over which they differed. And they say, why is a sign not sent down to him from his Lord? How come he doesn't show any fancy miracles? So say, the unseen is only for Allah to administer. So wait, indeed, I am with you among those who wait. And when we give the people a taste of mercy after adversity has touched them, at once they conspire against our verses. Subhanallah. Immediately they turn against Allah. Say, Allah is swifter in strategy. Indeed, our messengers record that which you conspire. So you cannot trick Allah. It is He who enables you to travel on land and sea until when you are in ships and they sail with them by a good wind and they rejoice therein. There comes a storm wind and the waves come upon them from everywhere and they assume that they are surrounded. Now they feel like this is it. Then they begin to supplicate Allah, sincere to Him in religion. If you should save us from this, we will surely be among the thankful. So remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the muddar, meaning those who are in difficulty when they call upon Allah, even if they are those who don't believe in Allah. Because many people, in such situations, they turn to Allah. And really, we do experience moments where we realize that there is nothing, nothing at all that can bring us out of our difficulty other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, for example, a person has a health condition and then they have a scheduled, you know, surgery or treatment or something like that. And what happens? All surgeries are canceled because of the current pandemic. All appointments, everything has been delayed and deferred. So you see that, yes, I want to get better, but I know that this is not going to work. This is not going to work. Who is going to help me? Only Allah can help me. But there are some people who don't even break down before Allah in such desperation. Hearts have become so hard that even in such difficult circumstances, people don't cry before Allah. And the rest of the people, what is their behavior? That when He saves them, at once they commit injustice upon the earth without right. O mankind, your injustice is only against yourselves, being merely the enjoyment of worldly life. Then to us is your return, and we will inform you of what you used to do. Indeed, the example of this worldly life is only like rain, which we have sent down from the sky, that the plants of the earth absorb, those from which men and livestock eat, until when the earth has taken on its adornment and is beautified. And this is something that we can see these days. You know, all of these colors of spring, subhanAllah. And it's people suppose that they have capability over it. What happens? There comes to it our command by night or by day. And we make it as a harvest. One night. And what happens? There is frost or one storm and everything finished. As if it had not flourished yesterday. Thus do we explain in detail the signs for a people who give thought. The thing is that Worldly life and the things of this world, they feel so important. But eventually, any, no matter how important something is, it becomes as though it never was. So no matter how expensive, how valuable something in worldly life is, how hard you have worked for it, remember, this world will come to an end and it will be as if it never existed before. So don't waste yourself away over what is temporary, over what is going to come to an end. And on the Day of Judgment, worldly life will literally feel like nothing. But right now, it feels like everything. And this is the reason why we obsess so much over it and we cry so much over it. But every year as the season changes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of the reality of the world. But we need that ibra. We need to take that lesson and remember that lesson. We learned that on the Day of Judgment, a person from the people of hell will be brought out. And this will be a person who lived a life of ease and plenty. And he will be asked that, did you ever experience any blessing? And he will say, by Allah, never. I never experienced anything good. So hell will make a person forget about every good thing that they enjoyed. So don't focus just on worldly enjoyment. Also focus on the hereafter. And especially when you are enjoying the things of this world because they're not unlawful, always check yourself. Is this something that my Lord would approve? 
Is this something that would make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy? Is this something that would bring me closer to Allah? To His pleasure? Or is this something by which Allah will be displeased with me even if people are very, very impressed by me? Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. And Allah invites to the home of peace and guides whom He wills to a straight path. Salam, home of safety and soundness, where nothing deteriorates, where there is only increase in blessings. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادًا For them who have done good is the best reward and extra. Increase, only increase, no deterioration, because Jannah is the home of salam. And what is that increase in reward for the people of Jannah? It is the privilege of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No darkness will cover their faces, nor humiliation. Those are companions of paradise. They will abide therein eternally. So there will be no gloom on them, no sadness on them. They will only be happy. We learn that in Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the people of Jannah, that do you wish me to give you anything more? And they will say, have you not brightened our faces? Meaning you have given us so much that the joy, the nur is visible in our faces. Have you not admitted us into Jannah and saved us from the fire? Meaning what more could we desire? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show himself to them. They will see Allah. And at that time, they will feel that there is nothing more dearer, more enjoyable than the sight of their Lord. وَأَسْأَلُكَ لَذَّةَ النَّظَرِ إِلَىٰ وَجْهِكَ But they who have earned blame for evil doings, the recompense of an evil deed is its equivalent. And humiliation will cover them. They will have from Allah no protector. It will be as if their faces are covered with pieces of the night. So covered in gloom are they. Those are the companions of the fire. They will abide therein eternally. And mention the day we will gather them all together. Then we will say to those who associated others with Allah, remain in your place, you and your partners. Then we will separate them. And their partners will say, you did not use to worship us. Subhanallah. They will be abandoned by the very beings that they used to worship. And sufficient is Allah as a witness between us and you that we were of your worship unaware. There on that day, every soul will be put to trial for what it did previously. And they will be returned to Allah, their master, the truth. And lost from them is whatever they used to invent. Say, who provides for you from the heaven and the earth? Or who controls hearing and sight? So then who should you worship? Whose pleasure should you seek? And who brings the living out of the dead and brings the dead out of the living? And who arranges every matter? They will say, Allah. So say, then will you not fear him? For that is Allah your Lord, the truth. And what can be beyond truth except error? So remember, there is only one haqq. Because فَمَاذَا بَعْدَ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ So how are you averted? Thus, the word of your Lord has come into effect upon those who defiantly disobeyed that they will not believe. Say, are there of your partners any who begins creation and then repeats it? Meaning, is there anyone who is able to resurrect the dead? Say, Allah begins creation and then repeats it. So how are you deluded? Say, are there of your partners any who guides to the truth? Say, Allah guides to the truth. So is he who guides to the truth more worthy to be followed? Or he who guides not unless he is guided? Then what is wrong with you? How do you judge? Any one is a creature who needs the help of others, who is dependent on others. Even an idol, for example, it has to be transported. Creation needs to be guided. They need to find their way. And Allah is the one who guides, who creates. There is a huge difference between the creator and the creation. So don't make them equal. And most of them follow not except assumption. Indeed, assumption avails not against the truth at all. One is fact and the other is assumption, a theory. Don't think that they're equal. They're not equal. Indeed, Allah is knowing of what they do. And it was not possible for this Qur'an to be produced by other than Allah. 
It can only be the word of Allah. But it is a confirmation of what was before it and a detailed explanation of the former scripture about which there is no doubt from the Lord of the worlds. And if we remember this, that this Quran is from the Lord of the worlds, then we would accept everything it says. Or do they say about the Prophet that he invented it? Say, then bring forth a surah like it and call upon for assistance, whomever you can besides Allah, if you should be truthful. Because you know what? If I can do it, then you should be able to do it too. Rather, they have denied that which they encompass not in knowledge and whose interpretation has not yet come to them. Thus did those before them deny. Then observe how was the end of the wrongdoers. And of them are those who believe in it, and of them are those who do not believe in it. And your Lord is most knowing of the corruptors. And if they deny you, Then say, for me are my deeds, and for you are your deeds. You are dissociated from what I do, and I am dissociated from what you do. So let me do my work. And among them are those who listen to you. Meaning they listen, but they don't understand. Because if they did, they would have believed. But can you cause the deaf to hear, although they will not use reason? So this shows us that mere listening is not enough. It is not enough to just listen to good things and to know about them. Action is necessary. We learn in a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, Woe to those who hear the word but persist on what they have been doing while they know. Meaning, they know, they have found out, but still they persist. So woe to them. So listen to Qur'an in a way that it goes inside. It penetrates your soul so that it transforms you. And when you listen, listen for the purpose of changing yourself, improving yourself. Listen so that you can learn things that you can do. Not just listen to things that you're like, oh wow, that is amazing. And the next day forget about it. And among them are those who look at you. But can you guide the blind although they will not attempt to see? The fact is that the people of Mecca saw the Prophet ﷺ. They knew his akhlaq, his manner. His face was not that of a liar. But they refused to see the truth in him. Abdullah ibn Salam said that when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina and everybody rushed to see him, he said, I saw him and I knew that his face was not the face of a liar. Indeed, Allah does not wrong the people at all, but it is the people who are wronging themselves. And on the day when He will gather them, it will be as if they had not remained in the world but an hour of the day, and they will know each other. Yani on the day of judgment, life of the world will seem so short that it will be as if they lived only for a day or part of a day. And then they will know each other. They will recognize each other. Those will have lost who denied the meeting with Allah and were not guided. And whether we show you some of what we promised them or we take you in death, to us is their return. Then either way, Allah is a witness concerning what they're doing. And for every nation is a messenger. So when their messenger comes, it will be judged between them in justice and they will not be wronged. And they say, when is the fulfillment of this promise if you should be truthful? They impatiently demanded the punishment. Say, I possess not for myself any harm or benefit except Allah should will. Because the fact is that all power is with Allah and Allah alone. No one else. For every nation is a specified term. When their time has come, then they will not remain behind an hour, nor will they precede it. Say, have you considered if his punishment should come to you by night or by day? For which aspect of it would the criminals be impatient? Meaning is the adab even something that you should be eager for? Then is it that when it has actually occurred, you will believe in it now and you were once for it impatient? Then it will be said to those who had wronged, taste the punishment of eternity. Are you being recompensed except for what you used to earn? And they ask information of you. Is it true? Meaning the day of judgment, is it really true? Say, yes, by my Lord. Indeed, it is truth. And you will not cause failure to Allah. And if each soul that wronged had everything on earth, it would offer it in ransom. And they will confide regret when they see the punishment. And they will be judged in justice. And they will not be wronged. Unquestionably, to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Unquestionably, the promise of Allah is truth, but most of them do not know. And in their ignorance, they're so proud. 
Who is God? Who is Allah? Who is the one who is worthy of worship? He is the one who gives life and causes death, and to him you will be returned. So, ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, qad ja'atkum maw'ilatum min rabbikum. There has come to you instruction from your Lord, meaning you have received it now. Wa shifa'un lima fi sudur and healing for what is in the chests. What is a healing? The Qur'an. وَهُدًا And guidance. وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And a mercy for the believers. قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ Say, in the bounty of Allah and in His mercy. فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا In that, let them rejoice. Why rejoice? Because هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ It is better than what they accumulate. Meaning, on having the Qur'an, they should be happy. Why? Because it is better than everything that people accumulate. How is it better? Look at this. It's just one book, but it has so many benefits. A source of endless benefit. How? First of all, it's an effective admonition. Meaning, it tells you what you need to know. It doesn't just give information, but it hits the heart. So that it becomes transformative. And then the Qur'an is shifa, meaning if you follow its prescriptions, this will heal you. It will solve your problems. Whether it is the waswas of shaitan, or it is worry, or grief, or it is bad intentions, or it is bad desires, whatever it is, the Qur'an will bring shifa. Ibn Qayyim said, there is no disease of the heart or of the body, except that the Qur'an can cure it. It can guide to its healing. So this is why we see that once a woman was being treated for something, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Ali Jiha bi kitabillah, treat her with the book of Allah. So yes, take the medication, yes, go for therapy, but Quran is shifa. Take that as well. And then we see Quran is also huda, guidance in this life, in every matter, big and small. And in the next life also, it will lead to Jannah. And then the Qur'an is mercy, because it will take a person to Jannah. And even in the world, in gatherings where people study the Qur'an, mercy envelops them. It is truly better than anything else that we have. So gather more and more of the Qur'an. It's recitation, memorization, knowledge, it's understanding, and of course, it's action. And then be happy. Because it brings delight. فَلْيَفْرَحُوا They should be happy. Say, have you seen what Allah has sent down to you of provision, of which you have made some lawful and some unlawful? Say, has Allah permitted you to do that? Or do you invent something about Allah? And what will be the supposition of those who invent falsehood about Allah on the day of resurrection? Indeed, Allah is full of bounty to the people. He is so generous to mankind. But most of them are not grateful. Subhanallah. And you are not engaged in any matter. Meaning, any matter that you are busy in, whether it is something good or bad, whether you are in pain or you're perfectly fine, whether you're struggling with what you're doing or you're really enjoying it, whether it's morning or night, whatever it is that you're doing, in whatever condition that you're in, or recite any of the Qur'an, and you people do not do any deed except that we are witness over you. Allah is watching us the entire time. And He sees, He knows what people don't know, what people don't see. Because you see, certain conditions are invisible. If a person has a broken arm, it's very visible that they're in pain. But if a person is suffering from something in their heart, in their mind, then that is invisible. So people don't acknowledge it. People don't even accept it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what condition you are in and what you are doing. And this is why we must live with the consciousness and the remembrance of Allah and the fear of Allah. That we should not do anything in any of our states that would be displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those who live like this, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Unquestionably, for the allies of Allah, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Meaning, even if they grieve for some time, their grief is not going to be permanent. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring them relief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring them moments of joy and delight and sweet pleasure even in extreme pain. So much so that they can smile, like Asiya did, while Fir'aun was torturing her. 
And we learn that in the hereafter, what is going to happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove, Allah will take away any fear and any grief from His friends, His righteous servants. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that there are people from the servants of Allah who are neither prophets nor martyrs. The prophets and martyrs will envy them on the day of judgment for their rank from Allah. So the people asked, who are they? Who could they be? And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there are people who love one another for the Quran without having any mutual kinship and nor giving property to one another. I swear by Allah, their faces will glow and they will be sitting in pulpits of light. They will have no fear on the day when the people will have fear and they will not grieve when the people will grieve. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited this ayah. So how does this begin? This begins by connecting with the Qur'an. So if we want that our grief and our fear leaves us forever for good, then we must connect with the Qur'an. And when you connect with the Qur'an, it's not that immediately your life will be perfect and you'll never feel sad. No, you will be sad. You will be afraid. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not leave you in your fear and your grief. He will bring you relief. And on the day of judgment, he will bring you permanent relief, insha'Allah. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ There are those who believed and were fearing Allah. So because of their iman, because of their taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them relief in both worlds. And Allah will give them what will satisfy them. So they will say, قَدْ رَضِينَا Ya Rabb, we are pleased. For them are good tidings in the worldly life and in the hereafter. No changes there in the words of Allah. That is what is the great attainment. Meaning this is certainly going to happen. Allah will give them good news in this life and also in the hereafter. What is the good news in this life? We learn Abu Dhar asked the Prophet ﷺ that, Ya Rasulullah, what do you say about when a person does a good deed for the sake of Allah and then people love him for it? So he said that is the immediate glad tidings of the believer. ذَلِكَ عَاجِلُ بُشْرَ الْمُؤْمِنِ That is Bushra, good news for the believer. That when you do something good with sincerity, then you see the good effects of it, ripple effects of it. Especially in your relationships. وَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُمْ And let not their speech grieve you. Meaning stop caring about what people say. Indeed, honor belongs to Allah entirely. He is the hearing the knowing. And the thing is that when a person befriends Allah, then the fear of people departs from their heart. Unquestionably, to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And those who invoke other than Allah do not actually follow any partners, meaning those partners are not real. They follow not except assumption, and they are not but falsifying. It is he who made for you the night to rest therein, and the day giving sight. Indeed in that are signs for people who listen. They have said Allah has taken a son. There are people who say Allah has a son, Jesus. Exalted is he. He is the one free of need. He doesn't need a son. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. You have no authority for this claim. How dare you say this? Do you say about Allah that which you do not know? Say, indeed, those who invent falsehood about Allah will not succeed. For them is brief enjoyment in this world. Then to us is their return. Then we will make them taste the severe punishment because they used to disbelieve. And recite to them the news of Nuh when he said to his people, O oh my people, if my residence and my reminding of the signs of Allah has become burdensome upon you, meaning it's been too long, you're getting fed up with me, then I have relied upon Allah. So you know what? Resolve upon your plan. Do something to harm me. And call upon your associates. Call upon these gods that you worship. Pray to them to harm me. Then let not your plan be obscure to you. Be very clear about it. Then carry it out upon me and do not give me respite. Meaning he challenged them so openly. And if you turn away from my advice, then no payment have I asked of you. My reward is only from Allah. And I have been commanded to be of the Muslims. But still, they denied him. So we saved him and those with him in the ship and made them successors. And we drowned those who denied our signs. Then see, how was the end of those who were warned? Then we sent after him messengers to their peoples. And they came to them with clear proofs, but they were not to believe in that which they had denied before. Thus we seal over the hearts of the transgressors. SubhanAllah. Those who reject the truth, then there comes a point where it becomes impossible for them to accept it later. 
because their ego blinds them. Then we sent after them Musa and Harun to Fir'aun and his establishment with our signs, but they behaved arrogantly and were criminal people. So when there came to them the truth from us, they said, indeed, this is obvious magic. Musa a.s. said, do you say thus about the truth when it has come to you? أَتَقُولُونَ لِلْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَكُمْ أَسِحْرٌ هَذَا Is this magic? You can see the strength in his words. And he was annoyed that how dare you say this is magic? This is not magic. But magicians will not succeed. They said, have you come to us to turn us away from that upon which we found our fathers? And so that you too may have grandeur in the land you want to take over? And we are not believers in you. And Fir'aun said, bring to me every learned magician. So when the magicians came, Musa said to them, throw down whatever you will throw. And then when they had thrown, Musa a.s. said, مَا جِئْتُمْ بِهِ السِّحْرِ What you have brought is only magic. إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَيُبْطِلُهُ Indeed, Allah will expose its worthlessness. Allah will destroy it. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُسْلِحُ عَمَلَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ Indeed, Allah does not amend the work of the corruptors. وَيُحِقُّ اللَّهُ الْحَقَّ بِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُجْرِمُونَ And Allah will establish the truth by His words, even if the criminals dislike it. So remember, magic has no power against the Qur'an. Against the ayat of Allah, against the haqq, Musa a.s. performed one miracle. And the magic of the magicians completely destroyed. But then after that, what happened? But no one believed Musa a.s. except some youths among his people. Why? Out of fear of Fir'aun and his establishment that they would persecute them. And this fear was real. It was not imaginary. Because indeed, Fir'aun was haughty within the land, very arrogant. And indeed, he was of the transgressors. And Musa said, O oh my people, if you have believed in Allah, then rely upon Him if you should be Muslims. So they said, Ala Allahi tawakkalna. Upon Allah do we rely. And then they prayed, Rabbana la taj'alna fitnatan lil qawmil Our Lord, make us not objects of trial for the wrongdoing people. Meaning, don't let us suffer persecution at their hands. And also, fitna, that don't let us suffer, because then they will think they're right. And save us by your mercy from the disbelieving people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to them. When? When they relied upon Him, and they made dua to Him. Our problem is, we make dua sometimes, we were very shaky. We're not that confident. So have tawakkul and make dua. And we inspire to Musa and his brother, settle your people in Egypt, in houses, and make your houses facing the Qibla. Or make your homes into places of worship, and establish prayer, and give good tidings to the believers. So we see that the Bani Israel in Egypt, they had no freedom. They were persecuted so much that they could not even congregate in order to pray together. So what were they told? Pray at home. And the Qur'an is amazing. Such beautiful guidance for us in our current situation. That there are times when we're not able to go to the masjid because of different situations. It's beyond our control. So just because a person cannot go to the masjid doesn't mean that they stop worshipping. No. Now worship at home. Make your homes into places of worship. Dedicate a place in your home where the entire family gathers to worship Allah together. Pray salah in congregation. And in the night, especially in the month of Ramadan, make sure that you're praying Qiyamul Layl together so that no one is missing out. And Musa alayhi salam said, Our Lord, indeed you have given Fir'aun and his establishment splendor and wealth in the worldly life. Our Lord, that they may lead men astray from your way. Meaning they have so much of this, And because of that, they're misguided and they're misguiding others. Our Lord, obliterate their wealth and harden their hearts so that they will not believe until they see the painful punishment. Musa a.s. prayed against Fir'aun and his people. Allah said, your supplication has been answered. So remain on a right course, meaning be firm. And follow not the way of those who do not know. Meaning be patient because there is a time for everything. And we took the children of Israel across the sea. And Fir'aun and his soldiers pursued them in tyranny and enmity. Until when drowning overtook him, he said, I believe that there is no deity except that in whom the children of Israel have believed. And I am of the Muslims. Subhanallah. Fir'aun believed right when he was drowning. He surrendered when he was dying. And a lot of people do the same thing. 
that they keep waiting, waiting, waiting. And they say, you know what? When I'm older, I'll go for Hajj. When I'm older, I'll start praying. Well, who knows? What if you never get to that state? And what if death comes suddenly? Have we not seen in recent days how literally families, any families, hundreds and thousands of people have died all of a sudden? Any, isn't this an ibra? So don't delay. It was said now and you had disobeyed him before and were of the corruptors. So today we will save you in body. Meaning he died at the time, but his body was preserved. Why? That you may be to those who succeed you a sign. That people will see your body and they will learn a lesson from you. And indeed, many among the people of our signs are heedless. And we had certainly settled the children of Israel in an agreeable settlement and provided them with good things. So their Sa'atul Usra also passed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed their difficulty into ease. So their difficulty was not permanent. And they did not differ until after knowledge had come to them. Indeed, your Lord will judge between them on the day of resurrection concerning that over which they used to differ. So if you are in doubt, O Prophet, about that which we have revealed to you, the Prophet ﷺ was never in doubt. It was the people who were in doubt. Then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord. So never be among the doubters. Meaning there have always been prophets before. Muhammad ﷺ was not a new prophet. And never be of those who deny the signs of Allah and thus be among the losers. Indeed, those upon whom the word of your Lord has come into effect will not believe, even if every sign should come to them until they see the painful punishment, just like Fir'aun. Then has there not been a single city that believed so its faith benefited it except the people of Yunus? When they believed, we removed from them the punishment of disgrace in worldly life and gave them punishment for a long time. So the people of Yunus, السلام, their situation was truly exceptional. And they were fortunate. How Yunus السلام, left them because he was angry with them because of their denial. And he was caught in the fish. And the people back in the city became afraid. And then they repented. So their tawbah was accepted, even though it was at the last moment. Otherwise, remember, tawbah is not accepted at the last moment, at the time of death. We see that in a hadith, that when three things appear, faith will not benefit a person who has not previously believed or has derived no good from his faith. What are those three things? The rising of the sun in its place of setting, meaning from the west, the appearance of the jal, and the Batul of the beast of the earth, which will come out very close to the day of judgment. And had your Lord willed, those on earth would have believed, all of them entirely. Allah could have forced people to believe, but He does not force them. Then would you compel the people in order that they become believers? Yani if Allah does not force, then why do you want to force? Why do you want to compel? And it is not for a soul to believe except by permission of Allah. All blessings are in Allah's hand, Allah's control, including faith. And He will place defilement upon those who will not use reason. So we should ask Allah for iman, for strength of iman. Say, observe what is in the heavens and the earth. Meaning, look at it yourself, reflect over it. But of no avail will be signs or warners to a people who do not believe. They don't benefit. So do they wait except for like what occurred in the days of those who had passed on before them? Say then wait. Indeed, I am with you among those who wait. Do you just want history to repeat itself? Do you want to be just like the nations of the past? Then we will save our messengers and those who have believed. Thus it is an obligation upon us that we save the believers. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ Say, O people, if you are still in doubt as to my religion, then I do not worship those which you worship besides Allah. But I worship Allah, only Allah, who causes your death. And I have been commanded to be of the believers. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who controls our death, meaning our return is to Him. And I have been commanded, direct your face toward the religion, inclining to truth, and never be of those who associate others with Allah. And do not invoke besides Allah that which neither benefits you nor harms you. For if you did, then indeed you would be of the wrongdoers. The Prophet ﷺ was never going to do shirk. But through him it is made clear 
that there is no exception to this rule. If a person calls upon other than Allah, then their worship will not be accepted. Such a person will be a loser in the hereafter. وَإِن يَمْسَسْكَ اللَّهُ بِضُرٍ فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُ And if Allah should touch you with adversity, there is no remover of it except Him. So what should we do in times of difficulty? We should call upon Allah, just as Yunus a.s. called upon Him. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ We should call upon Allah, just as the Bani Israel did. That عَلَى اللَّهِ تَوَكَّلْنَا they called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if there should be adversity on you, there is no remover of it except Him. And if He intends for you good, then there is no repeller of His bounty. So don't fear that people will ruin your blessings for you because they cannot. He causes it to reach whom He wills of His servants and He is the forgiving, the merciful. Say, O mankind, the truth has come to you from your Lord. The Qur'an is here. The message of the Qur'an is clear. So whoever is guided is only guided for the benefit of his soul. So if you change yourself according to the book of Allah, that is better for you. And whoever goes astray only goes astray in violation against it. Meaning, he is going to suffer himself. And I am not over you a manager. Meaning, I'm not here to compel you. And follow what is revealed to you, O Prophet. And be patient until Allah will judge. And he is the best of judges. So we see over here that the Prophet ﷺ is told, follow what has been revealed and at the same time be patient. And these are two things that we need to do. We need to focus on what we can do. The ways in which we can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The avenues of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up for us. Instead of just complaining about the difficulty that we're facing. And then secondly, we need to have sabr. We need to have patience until relief comes. So both action and patience. And this shows us that patience doesn't mean inaction. It doesn't mean being passive, that you sit down and do nothing. No, first, tabir, follow. And then, wasbir, have patience. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Surah Hud, Alif Lam Ra. This is a book whose verses are perfected and then presented in detail from one who is wise and acquainted. This is Allah. Remember, this book is from him. Through a messenger saying, do not worship except Allah. Indeed, I am to you from him, a warner and a bringer of good tidings. And saying, seek forgiveness of your Lord and repent to him. And he will let you enjoy a good provision for a specified term. So remember, the Prophet of Allah was not sent to judge people, to say that, you know what, you're going to hell and you're going to hell. No, he was sent to invite people to seek forgiveness from their Lord. And we need to do the same thing. Instead of passing judgment on people, we need to bring them hope. And we need to show them the benefits of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That seek forgiveness. And look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open His blessings upon you. And give every doer of favor His favor. Meaning Allah will not waste your effort. If you do good, Allah will do good to you. But if you turn away, then indeed I fear for you the punishment of a great day. إِلَى اللَّهِ مَرْجِعُكُمْ To Allah is your return, and He is over all things competent. Unquestionably, they, meaning the disbelievers, turn away their chests to hide themselves from Him. Meaning they turn away in order to hide themselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or, when they would see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they would turn away in order to avoid Him. But even when they cover themselves in their clothing, Allah knows what they conceal and what they declare. So even if a person is hiding under a blanket, but their phone is with them, and they're looking at things which are inappropriate, Allah knows what they're concealing and what they're declaring. Indeed, He is knowing of that within the chests. So remember, nothing at all is hidden from Allah. Our external and our internal is known to Allah. So we should not be concerned about our image before people and obsessing over, you know, people accepting us as good individuals. No, our concern should be to mend our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is only possible if we fear Him in private and in public. When we remember that Allah knows what we reveal and what we hide. And Allah knows what we keep in our chests. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us 
his taqwa. Inshallah, we will conclude over here. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, we completed the Jews 11. Barakallahu fikum everyone. How was it? Beautiful, isn't it? SubhanAllah. We we'll just have a quick review, very quick action points we'll just take and so we'll just go through. So then, oh, SubhanAllah, we have I've taken the 15 minutes more time of you. May Allah put lots of barakah in your time. So what is the reward of being a forerunner in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them with what? It's pleased when we do the deeds that are accepted, like you know, and the sins are forgiven and admit uh, and admit um, admitted to Jannah. I'll just go very quickly, so I will send the slide to you, and so you can look into it. And benefits of giving um, sadqa is increase in righteousness, more opportunities to do good, and guilt is replaced with hope of be becoming a better person. What is the benefit of istighfar? Is the good provision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have favors on us, fadl and opportunities of goods and du'as are answered when you keep doing the istighfar. And alhamdulillah, we have seen this on the, the repenting, the worshippers, the praises, the travelers, the one who boasts, the one who prostrates, the one who enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And those who observe the limits said by Allah, you have to check ourselves. Am I one of them? So please do check on yourself. So and the last point and the action points, inshallah, we'll just go through. Yeah. So we have to be the first one. Be the first one in, be the first one in making dua, be the first one in how many ways you can do. Like, you know, make even when someone is sick, be the first one to go and visit them. So try to be the first one in everything. Okay. And the second is Sadfa, certainly purifies, right? SubhanAllah. And never feel discouraged. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always willing to forgive you repentance. And the great success is through how do we attain success? So the great success is attained through the Allah, through Allah's pleasure. Okay, so no achievement is bigger than this. Alhamdulillah, with this, Alhamdulillah, we completed the uh, Jews 11. Jazakumullahu khairan kaseer, everyone. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Shadu Allah ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. See you all tomorrow, inshaAllah.